All right, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Alden Kindred of America's presentation of John Alden and the long history of Plymouth Colony. My name is Desiree Mobed and I'm the executive director. The Alden Kindred preserves and shares the legacy of Mayflower passengers, John and Priscilla Alden, and their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts, through guided tours of the museum, educational programs, lineage research exhibitions, and publications. I'd like to offer a special welcome to those Alden Kindred members joining us today and whose support make programs like this possible. Um, we'd also like to welcome all the Alden and Mayflower descendants, the history enthusiasts, and um, to those of you who are joining us for the first time. On this very frigid and snowy day in New England, um, we are delighted to welcome historian and author John Turner for this virtual talk. Most historians equate Plymouth Colony with the Mayflower Crossing and the first Thanksgiving, and then pay little attention to Plymouth once the larger Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, took root. Despite that though, Plymouth Colony endured for seven decades. And for many of those years, John Alden was one of the colony's magistrates. An impressive time of public service, no matter what generation. Our speaker today will help us explore what we can learn from John Alden about his colony's religious, political, and social order. John G. Turner is joining us today from Virginia, where he is a professor of religious studies at George Mason University. He writes and speaks about the place of religion in American culture and history, and is the author of the book, They Knew They Were Pilgrims, Plymouth Colony and the Contest for American Liberty, which is the basis of his talk today. After John's talk, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question and answer function. And if you have to leave early or you would like to share this program with others, a recording will be posted on the Alden website. And now let's welcome John Turner. John, thank you. Thanks so much, Desiree. And I'm gonna share a few images as well. Um, I really felt at home seeing some of the greetings in the chat. Uh, I noticed there were a couple of people joining from uh, Virginia and someone joining from Rochester, New York, which is uh, my hometown. So that was, you know, that was really nice. Um, so my subject today is John Alden and the long history of Plymouth Colony. Um, I'm trying a way, to, I'm having a little trouble with my screen share. Let me just try it a second time. Um, doesn't seem to want me to be able to actually show the slides. Let's see. We can see them. Yeah, Wait. well, I wanna make it look a little bit better. There we yeah, go. Yeah, you wanna push it on that big, there you go. Yeah, I think I'm set. So okay. I, I, know so, I know some of you are familiar with this long uh, eulogy and poem uh, published upon John Alden's uh, death, uh, written by uh, the town of Plymouth's minister, uh, John Cotton, uh, who notes that uh, Alden was about uh, 89 years of age, which always reminds me that with John Alden, we bump into so much uncertainty uh, and myth. You know, when was he born? John Alden might not have known exactly when he was born. In 1682, he referred to himself as 83 years as aged 83 years or thereabout. You know, either he didn't know the date or didn't want to do the math. Um, I'm, now that I'm getting older, I think I'm going to start telling people I'm 48 years old or thereabout. You know, where did he come from? Who were his parents? Uh, as many of you know, there are theories 
but they aren't by any means conclusive. How did he happen to be on the Mayflower? Did he know Captain Jones? Did he know the Mullins family? Did he actually own the Bible at Pilgrim Hall or the one that's held in Dartmouth's library? Many of these basic questions about John Alden uh, remain unanswerable. And at the same time, we know an enormous amount of information about him. He appears frequently, um, very frequently in the records of Plymouth Colony. And for a point of comparison, John Alden's life is very well documented in comparison to that of his wife, Priscilla. We have to use a range of decades uh, to estimate uh, her year of death for instance. You know, we know a lot about John Alden, uh, in part uh, because year after year, the colonists who could vote chose him as one of their magistrates, and he was deputy governor uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, he played a role in shaping the colony's uh, military policy and affairs. Um, so he was prominent, uh, which is why we know a fair amount uh, about him. Um, I like the way that John Cotton comments that whilst to choose they had their liberty uh, within the limits of this colony, their civil leaders, him they ever chose. Uh, he was one of uh, Plymouth's uh, pillars. Um, and Cotton was writing this just after uh, Plymouth Colony had temporarily lost its uh, liberty to select their own political leaders. John Alden's name also appears frequently in deeds as he was engaged in a, a large number of uh, property transactions. You know, in, in many respects, John Alden is synonymous uh, with the history of Plymouth Colony. He was alive during nearly all of the colony's seven decade, decades of self-government. Um, John Cotton noted that, you know, 67 years uh, of Plymouth Colony's history he had lived, and that he of them had made a serious observation and could of them uh, present a large narration. He had seen it all. He could narrate it all. I just wish he had narrated it all, uh, but he didn't, at least not in print. Unlike William Bradford or Edward Winslow or Josiah Winslow or Thomas Prince, or really a host of other 17th century New England figures, we don't have letters, a history, or a journal uh, from John Alden. And thus, while we know a great deal about what John Alden did, we know hardly anything about what he thought. Even as we might praise him as a plain, humble tradesman and farmer, you know, that feels a little bit unsatisfying. Uh, he leaves us wanting to know more. But lest we despair, John Alden's long life and career can help us understand the history of Plymouth Colony much better. And maybe in the process, the long history of Plymouth Colony can help us know John Alden better. And so that's what uh, I'm going to focus on uh, this afternoon. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, three points of intersection between John Alden's life and this larger history. Uh, the first is the fur trade, secondly, uh, land, and then finally, uh, religion. We'll start with the fur trade. Besides his marriage, one of the things or one of the episodes in John Alden's life that is most well known is um, his role in Plymouth Colony's uh, 
fur trade. Uh, he was among the colony's leaders in that respect. And, you know, I think his, his activities in that respect, um, you know, they, they sort of represent his upward economic and social mobility. Uh, in uh, 1627, um, Alden became one of eight undertakers who assumed the colony's debts and its fur trading prospects. Alongside John Howland, Alden was the only man among the undertakers who had been in truly humble circumstances at the time of the Mayflower crossing. Uh, this group of men, uh, the undertakers, became the most prominent political and economic leaders of the colony uh, for many decades to come. And Alden's inclusion among them is a reminder of the remarkable social mobility that migration to New England offered. Certainly, it didn't work out for everyone, and there was relatively less of that social, social upward mobility as the decades passed. But the idea that a ship's cooper could obtain land and positions of leadership, it is pretty remarkable. Howland is a second good example. And even men like Edward Winslow, who came from higher circumstances, saw their star move higher still uh, in New Plymouth. It's through this work in the fur trade that one of the more dramatic moments in Alden's life emerges. And I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with this episode, uh, but I want to narrate it in part because I want to put it in, in its broader context. Uh, Plymouth Colony obtained a patent for a fur trading outpost on the Kennebec River in present-day Maine, but the colony had a hard time holding on to uh, this uh, preferred uh, place of trading because other traders repeatedly tried to encroach on their purported turf. In 1634, uh, some men from a nearby outpost at Piscataqua, led by a man named John Hawking, went up the Kennebec to try to buy furs before uh, they reached the Plymouth outpost. John Howland was in charge of Plymouth's outpost at the time, and John Alden was also on the scene. Plymouth's men went up the Kennebec to put an end, to try to put an end to the threat. Howland demanded that the interlopers leave. Hawking refused. So Howland ordered his men to cut the cables that were holding Hawking's vessel in place. When Plymouth's Moses Talbot performed this task, Hawking shot him. One of Plymouth's men immediately shot Hawking in return. Both men uh, were dead. What happened next is one of the sort of famous moments in Alden's life. He and his party put in at Boston on their way back to Plymouth. Um, the Piscataqua men did so as well. And they accused the Plymouth leaders of fomenting the conflict and of essentially murdering Hawking. The Bay Colony's leaders concluded that uh, the Plymouth men were at least potentially culpable in Hawking's death. The Bay Colony took action. They detained John Alden. I don't know that they necessarily jailed or imprisoned him, which is sometimes written, but they at least forced him to post bond and promise not to leave the Bay Colony until the case was resolved. Uh, the Bostonians also, uh, as John Winthrop wrote, refused to hold communion with their Plymouth counterparts. They told them that they had sinned and should repent, and perhaps they refused to allow Alden or the others to partake of the Lord's Supper in the meantime. William Bradford and then Governor of Plymouth Colony Thomas Prince were irate 
because the Bay Colony didn't have any jurisdiction in the case. They also expressed concern that the deaths would provide political ammunition to their religious enemies across the Atlantic. In reality, though, the detention of John Alden at Boston points to a singular and neglected moment in the history of Plymouth Colony. Plymouth has a not undeserved reputation as a marginal, tiny economic backwater of a colony. You know, that maybe that emerges partly because of the colony's struggles during its earliest years and William Bradford's lament about Plymouth being sort of left like a widow when um, colonists like John Alden departed for somewhat greener fields. And then the Bay Colony's much larger population, economic clout, and military strength. But for a brief moment in the late 1620s and the early 1630s, Plymouth Colony, under the leadership of men like John Alden, was the dominant regional economic power uh, in New England. And there are a number of uh, episodes uh, in this story. In the late 1620s, uh, Plymouth's leaders arrested Thomas Morden, famous for his Marymount outpost on the southern rim of Massachusetts Bay, uh, and also famous for its Maypole, which Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote about uh, in a lovely short story. Uh, Morden's men had done precisely what John Hawking tried to do, preempt Plymouth's Kennebec River trade. Um, you know, and as a bit of a tangent, there's been all sorts of discussion over the years that what um, the pilgrims didn't like was that Morden's men danced around a maypole, got drunk, and frolicked with Indian maidens. And I'm sure the Plymouth leaders didn't like those things, but they probably wouldn't have bothered Morden if Morden and his men uh, hadn't threatened to corner uh, their prosperous fur trade. And ironically, Plymouth's leaders did to others what they didn't want others to do to them. In 1633, one year before Alden's arrest in Boston, Plymouth sent men up the Connecticut River above a Dutch trading post. The Dutch threatened to fire at the English ship, but unlike John Howland, they were bluffing. Uh, the Plymouth men built an outpost above the Dutch, and that year, Plymouth shipped over 3,000 pounds of beaver uh, skins to England, and the undertakers made a very handsome profit that year. When the Bay Colony's John Winthrop sized up the situation, he saw Plymouth not as a marginal minor player, but as having a stranglehold on the fur trade. Winthrop wrote, they of Plymouth having engrossed all the chief places of trade in New England, Kennebec, Penobscot, Narragansett, and Connecticut have erected trading houses in all of them. John Alden and the other undertakers stood to get rich. That's why the Bay Colony detained John Alden. And the next year it all fell apart for the undertakers. The French took Plymouth's Penobscot outpost, the Bay Colony outflanked them on the Connecticut River, and Plymouth's leaders eventually sold the Kennebec uh, claim. Plymouth Colony did become an economic backwater of sorts, especially in comparison to the Bay Colony, but it's worth remembering that John Alden contributed to Plymouth's fleeting but nonetheless impressive economic success. And had the colon colonists been able to pull it off 10 years earlier, it might have changed the course of New England uh, settlement. We don't know a great many details about Alden's activities in the trade, though he kept, manage kept uh, managing the Kenne Kennebec claim for some years to come until it was finally sold. But we do know that he was on the scene at one of its pivotal moments, and the colony's other leaders clearly trusted him with this important mission. 
So my second topic is land. Uh, John Alden is most associated with the land uh, where the Alden House sits today, along with Miles Standish, his move to the northern end of uh, Plymouth Bay saddened William Bradford, who envisioned a colony that remained a tight-knit, geographically bound congregation. Um, Alden's name and signature appear in deeds all over the colony. In the early 1650s, Alden became involved in a dispute in the town of Sandwich uh, between its residents and the sachem at Manomet. Um, that native leader had sold land to the English, but felt swindled out of his rights. Uh, John Alden helped broker a deal that granted the natives some acreage back and uh, the right to wood. Um, Alden helped facilitate additional purchases of uh, Manomet land in the years ahead. Here's a photograph of one of those deeds uh, now in the archives at Pilgrim Hall. Then in the 1660s, Alden purchased land from the Massachusetts sachem Josiah Wampatuck. The land lay along the Namaskat River on the border of the colonial townships of Bridgewater and Middleborough. Alden later purchased or received land in what had been the native villages of Namaskat and Titicut. What do we make of these transactions? Uh, they are events of great significance for the trajectory of Plymouth Colony in the 1660s and 1670s. On the one hand, if we examine the breadth of Alden's transactions, we see him providing for his children and his descendants in the 1670s and 1680s, as he grew aged, he provided for them by deeding them various parcels of land. Also, I think in at least some of the transactions, we see a concern for fairness or concord, as when he assuaged the concerns of the sachem at Manomet. At the same time, though, we see John Alden participating in the westward growth of the colony. Although the Poconocets and other native communities largely accepted the initial English settlement at Plymouth and probably at Duxbury as well, which was largely depopulated, that wasn't true to the west where native leaders at Mount Hope, Sakonet, Pocasset, and Namaskat were very wary of English encroachment on their land. As the English pushed west into Taunton, Bridgewater, Middleborough, Dartmouth, and Swansea, tensions built and became acute. And frankly, the record of many of these land transactions is disturbing. Oftentimes the English pressured, sued, and swindled uh, the Indians out of their land. If one sachem didn't sell, they found another, or they find a sachem who then had to sell. What became King Philip's War in the 1670s, and I know you have a program coming up on that subject uh, sometime in the near future, started with the murder of a native Christian, uh, not all that far from some of the land that John Alden had purchased uh, in the prior decade. So when we look at John Alden through the many deeds and property transactions that benefited his family, I think we should keep in mind that there was an enormous cost to native peoples from the relentless English expansion uh, to the West. So finally, uh, religion, which is such a central part of the Plymouth Colony story from the start, of course. Um, and I think it might be helpful just to reflect a little bit on the larger meaning of Plymouth Colony as Americans have understood it. You know, I think there has very much been the tra traditional view of brave 
religious uh, refugees uh, finding a sanctuary uh, at Plymouth. You know, more recently, you know, certainly a lot of historians and others have pushed back and instead have depicted the, the pilgrims as, you know, the, the advance guard in what became uh, the brutal conquest uh, of New England's native peoples. Sort of a, you know, saints versus sinners uh, divide. You know, I certainly think it's crucial that we tell uh, both parts um, of that story uh, in all of its complexity. And I think it's not, it's not terribly easy for us in the 21st century to, you know, understand the ins and outs of English Protestantism uh, in the 1600s. But I think if we, if we take a look at some of that history, we can speculate a bit about John Alden's own religious views and his role in that part of the colony's uh, history. So here's a really brief overview. Uh, I'm sure some of this is familiar to, to many of you, but I thought a, a super brief primer uh, might be uh, useful. Um, the pilgrims, for the most part, came from what I understand as a subspecies of Puritanism, known as separatism or Brownism. Puritans, more generally, uh, wanted to further purify the Church of England from anything that they regarded as a vestige of Catholicism or that they understood as not having biblical warrant. Um, these practices that they objected to could be anything from making the sign of the cross uh, at a baptism to uh, ministers wearing garments that look too priestly uh, to ecclesiastical courts uh, that were controlled by the state. Uh, Puritans had a really wide range of views on all sorts of things. Most of them worked to reform the church uh, from the inside. A number of the more radical Puritans uh, and examples would be Robert Brown and then John Robinson, the pilgrim's minister in Leiden, decided that reform simply couldn't wait. Christians had an obligation to withdraw from the Church of England and form their own covenanted congregations. Um, for Brown and for Robinson, this was a matter of Christian liberty, that Christians had been freed uh, by Christ, and part of that freedom entailed the liberty to choose their own leaders and to govern uh, themselves. The majority of Mayflower passengers, uh, at least in terms of the free adults, uh, were separatists. There's been a lot of analysis and debate about that point over the years, um, but I think the best scholarship uh, suggests that a majority were separatists. Um, most of the later arrivals to the colony and most emigrants to the Massachusetts Bay Colony were Puritans of some sort, uh, but not uh, separatists. And so how much did this matter uh, in New England? For the most part, whether they came from the particularities of separatism or from Puritanism or the Church of England more generally, a congregational consensus emerged across New England with the exception of Rhode Island. Uh, and that there were established congregational churches in towns uh, across the Bay Colony, Plymouth Colony, and those colonies that became uh, Connecticut. Plymouth Colony had a weaker religious establishment than Massachusetts Bay or Connecticut. There was, for the most part, tolerance for those who chose to remain aloof uh, from the churches. And there wasn't a religious test for political liberty, at least not during the colony's 
uh, earliest years. Mayflower Compact um, is a paramount example of that. Fractures within colonial leadership, however, emerged whenever dissenters challenged that consensus. And that happened repeatedly in Plymouth Colony and elsewhere. Um, I don't have time to go into the details of these episodes um, today, but uh, at various points, uh, dissenters wanted to go their own way and establish their own congregations uh, apart from the colony's established churches. And when these um, conflicts arose, particularly starting in the 1640s uh, forward, the colony's leaders generally were divided. Some magistrates wanted harsh punishment for dissenters, uh, some wanted a greater liberty of conscience. Um, John Alden uh, was part of the colony's leadership uh, throughout these decades. He wasn't a magistrate during a conflict in the mid-1640s over religious toleration, but he was a magistrate uh, during the 1650s and later when the Society of Friends or Quakers really posed a particularly sharp challenge to this religious uh, consensus. <coughs> Excuse me. The colony's magistrates were divided over the extent to which the colony's government should punish uh, Quakers. Um, Plymouth Colony, like Massachusetts Bay, uh, took a number of steps to try to stamp out um, Quakerism. They banished Quaker missionaries. They whipped uh, men and women who converted and joined the Society of Friends. They jailed missionaries. Uh, they fined people and um, took their possessions to satisfy uh, those fines. Some of the magistrates of Plymouth Colony, namely James Cudworth and Timothy Hatherley, um, dissented from this harsh treatment of Quakers. Cudworth wrote a letter denouncing persecution of Quakers. Timothy Hatherley resigned as a magistrate in protest. What about John Alden? Apparently, he wavered, but then decided to support then Governor Thomas Prince and the persecution. Humphrey Norton, a Quaker missionary frequently punished by the colony and who was branded with an H for heresy in New Haven, uh, wrote this, John Alden, I have weighed thy ways, and thou art like one fallen from thy first love, a tenderness a tenderness once I did see in thee, and moderation to act like a sober man, which through evil counsel and self-love thou art drawn aside from. <coughs> Norton urged Alden to not be a pack horse to Thomas Prince, and instead think for himself. Uh, follow Timothy Hatherley's example and quit his position as a magistrate. Alden wasn't persuaded. He kept his position. But a few years later, um, Plymouth's leaders abandoned their harsh persecution of the Quakers. The Bay Colony had become harsher. Uh, they punished a few repeat offenders by cutting off their ears, and they eventually executed four Quakers. Plymouth Colony didn't follow that uh, example. It backed back down to a certain extent. I think it's perhaps worth considering that John Alden, as someone who sort of was wavering on how to respond to the Quakers, is probably one of those men responsible for the fact that Plymouth Colony uh, did not exactly replicate the Bay Colony's harshest treatment of uh, the Quakers. So 
If we take a look at John Alden's long Plymouth colony life and career, I think we bring some aspects of the colony's history into sharper relief. And this long history helps us think in possibly new ways about John Alden's long life. Alden as an enforcer of Plymouth's Kennebec fur trade. Alden as an acquirer of Western land whose transactions were among the many that gradually pushed the Western native communities into war against the English and a Puritan and Congregationalist who wavered when confronted with other dissenting groups who wanted freedom for themselves. Still, at the end of the day, it's a shame that John Alden on these matters cannot speak for himself. Um, and I'll just put in a little bit of plug for my, my book. Um, they knew they were pilgrims, and I would love to chat with you about these and any other topics that are on your mind. Thank you so much, John. Um, that was wonderful and a wonderful perspective on John Alden. We do have several questions that have already come in, so I'd like to go ahead um, and um, start sharing them. I also want to tell you that um, somewhere in that in that group there is a John Alden. So we may hear from him. Who knows? He may speak yeah. for himself <laughs> some generation. <laughs> um, so let me go ahead and um, and just start sharing some of these. This is from Brenda. What was John's motivation to stay on in the colony? Mm. Well. I wish I knew, Brenda. That's such a great question. Um, so, I mean, I guess I could speculate. I mean, people have speculated he was in love or he had nothing holding him uh, to ties in England or he saw opportunity or he loved the weather. Um, it probably wasn't the, the latter. Um, you know, I think, I think we simply, you know, we, we don't know. Um, I do think we know that he, you know, he had decided at least by the time uh, they reached uh, Cape Cod to stay in the colony because he was one of the signers of the compact. Um, so whether or not he figured that out on the boat or whether that was a pre-existing plan or possibility, uh, we, we don't know. But it certainly wasn't wait through the winter, you know, see if a future wife is available and then, and then make the call. Um, so from Dennis, uh, the question comes, why did Plymouth lose the right to vote? Um, well, well, maybe I could ask you, Dennis, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, in I terms think, of the right, right to govern itself? Um, he may come back with that. So sure. we'll wait for him to do that. And then we'll, I'd like to um, touch on this one because this is interesting on the religious side of it. And that is the Anglicans and, you know, the pilgrims. And this is from Viola. It's a long question. Um, the Commonwealth of Virginia was settled by an Anglican majority. And as Anglicanism was, was as well a conflicting theocracy at the beginning of Plymouth Colony. In fact, a significant number of its settlers, the strangers would have been Church of England adherents. Would you comment on the Anglican presence at that time? Sure. I'm just gonna divide that question in half, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great, it's a great question. So, you know, I think first of all, Anglicanism as an identity isn't something that's really formed in the way that we would think of it in the 16-teens and 1620s. Uh, to be an Anglican, it really just means belonging to the Church of England, and almost everybody did, right, unless they were Catholic. So even among the early um, settlers of um, Jamestown and the Virginia colony, there are a number of ministers who were Puritans, who weren't uh, pleased with the current state of the Church of England and wanted to reform it and brought those principles um, to Virginia. Um, as time passed in that colony, most of the, most of the Virginia colonies ministers weren't uh, Puritans. 
as far as Plymouth Colony goes, um, you know, there's this episode in the mid 1620s when uh, John Lifford or Lyford, it sometimes uh, is pronounced, is sent over by the um, colony's financial backers in England. And he's often been thought of as an Anglican because he dissented uh, in the end from Plymouth separatism. You know, I think the best recent scholarship suggests he was actually a Puritan. And I, my suspicion is that is true of many of the individuals who've been labeled as strangers. So non-separatists, I think a lot of them leaned Puritan and a lot of the other early colonists who came leaned Puritan. In terms of Anglicanism, as you know, it later develops around this idea of beauty and um, sort of maybe more wiggle room on theology, sort of anti-Calvinism. Very few folks from you know, that sort of religious persuasion uh, come to Plymouth Colony. You get a few in the Bay Colony um, later in the 1600s, but Plymouth, you know, you get, you get, you know, Puritans, Separatists, and then later a lot of Baptists and Quakers in the western part of the colony. So we're going to switch to a different, um, we've got a lot of questions on religion, but I want to mix it up a little bit. This one comes from Dr. Terry Monroe. Um, is there a record of John Alden's accounts of lucrative fur trading that allowed him to purchase the Duxbury property? And I'm not sure, Terry, if you're talking about the original land grant or if you're talking about um, the uh, additional acreage that Alden acquired. But um, John, do you want to touch on the grants to yeah. start? I mean, I, I, you know, it's a great question. I don't know. I mean, you know, by the way, I'm not an Alden expert. Um, <laughs> I'm not a John Turner expert either. He was a passenger <laughs> on the Mayflower. I wish I was a descendant of him. That would be sort of a famous thing. Um, <laughs> You know, there's speculation that John Alden, you know, inherited a modest amount of um, wealth, or not inherited, but when he married uh, Priscilla Mullins, you know, that that perhaps was a little bit of infusion of um, prosperity into his circumstances. I don't think it was massive. Um, I think, you know, it, clearly he had established himself as a diligent and reliable young man uh, by 1626, 27, which is why he's chosen as one of the undertakers. But in terms of the details of the transactions that enabled him to, to purchase the land, I, I don't know. And I, I don't know that that evidence is out there. I, I think probably not. There is some speculation because, uh, you know, when he's in his older years, it, it seems like they do grant him some um, some income or some money because, you know, there's a reference to him being low in his estate. And that's probably just because of all that wonderful public service that he had been giving. Um, and so there is some thought that there may have been some land granted to him, you know, as part payment, but we don't know for sure. Yeah, so here's you know, another, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, Go just ahead, say, I'll just say one thing about that. You know, is I, I don't read that as he's really in hard circumstances. Yeah. We've got to give him these 10 pounds. It's yeah. more that we want to reward him for his service. They do that with um, Josiah Winslow at one point later. And, you know, I think maybe it was a little cash poor at the time, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think he was really hard up. No, land rich, maybe a little cash for it, right? Um, so from Betsy, aside from purchasing a land from various sachems, do we know much about John Alden's attitude um, and or relationship with Osamequin before his death or his sons? Well, I don't know anything about it. You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, so in terms of the figures for whom we do have some sense of that, uh, Edward Winslow and uh, William Bradford, <coughs> you know, what, what Winslow writes about his interactions 
with Usamequin and other natives in the early 1620s, I think those, those are just remarkable sources. And they're remarkable in part because they allow a window into you know, how his views emerge during that contact. You know, it, you know, for instance, Winslow at first says these people have no religion. Then in a subsequent tract, he, he, I, I think he might even say that he was wrong about that. Mm. And they do have these beliefs and practices, which he tries his best to line up with Christianity. Um, and, you know, Winslow is one of the few people who really spends a lot of time in intimate circumstances with natives in the early 1620s. You know, on the other hand, you know, William Bradford's writings in the 1650 um, evidence a substantial dislike for and fear of, of natives. Um, I don't know, in terms of John Alden, I'm not gonna speculate because I don't think the sources are there. Um, and this is from, this is an anonymous question, um, but it's, I, I think it's a good one to touch on. How was John chosen to be a magistrate and was that an elected position? And when did the, three parts, when did the English settlers start to elect positions like selectmen? These were, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a, those are great questions. So, you know, first of all, we know that they elect a governor immediately and annually. Um, and then at a certain point in the 16, mid 1620s, maybe even by 1623, I can't remember, they think that Bradford needs an assistant. Um, and the number of those assistants expands. And then we simply find John Alden among those assistants to the governor, among those magistrates. I think it's in 1632 or 33, yeah. the, fir the first yeah. reference. Yeah. So we, we don't know if he becomes one that year or perhaps three years earlier, uh, you know, and then he's chosen as a deputy uh, from Duxbury uh, as well. It's curious that he's not um, a magistrate and assistant in the 1640s. For the most part, he takes a break. I presume that's not because there's any sort of competitive election or that people were dissatisfied with him. Uh, but, you know, Bradford took a few breaks as, as governor. Um, and I suspect Alden did the, did the same thing, maybe tended to his own affairs. For the most part, uh, Plymouth Colony elections on that level were sort of a matter of course. Uh, it, was, it was all about incumbency. Once, once you were in, you were pretty much in, unless um, like James Cudworth or Timothy Hatherley, you, you ran into trouble over the Quaker issue. Um, so I'm gonna, I wanna I share this question from Louise and that's what was the age, because it's sort of related to this one. What was the age when one could vote in a religious group in the 1600s? And so the signers of the compact were over 18 as being a church group or a, covent, a conventicle? So that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I wonder if someone like Frank Bramer or Jeremy Bangs knows the answer to that question. Mm. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if there was a customary age or if it was more of an ad ad hoc thing. You know, in in terms of Plymouth Colony's own laws, I don't think they specify the age at which an individual could become a freeman uh, with voting rights, um, which, <coughs> excuse me, points to the fact that they really, really don't spell out those qualifications at all and seems to have been an ad hoc um, matter for the general court to determine. Can I, can I, Desiree, can I answer one question? In yes, the, please. The chat? Yeah, because I've, I've, yep, go ahead. Yeah, just um, someone asked me about the inspiration behind the book title. And so I thought I'd just say that's from William Bradford's history. Um, and I, you know, I really like this particular passage in um, his history when he's writing about uh, the congregation uh, breaking apart really in Leiden with one faction 
choosing to go uh, establish this column and the, and the others uh, remaining behind. And it's a tearful scene. And Bradford um, alluding to a verse in the New Testament epistle to the Hebrews, he says that, you know, although they had no idea what the earthly outcome uh, would be, uh, whether they would get to their destination, what would become of them, uh, they knew they were pilgrims and looked, you know, kept their eyes to the, to the heavens uh, because they were sure of that part of their uh, destination. And by pilgrims, he simply means, you know, a, a true Christian. Um, so I want to circle back to Dr. Terry Monroe's question um, and the record of John Alden's accounts of, of fur trading that allowed him to purchase the property in Duxbury. And she does mention that that was both properties. Do you want to, we did sort of touch on that. Yeah, I, I don't bit. have a better answer. Does yeah. It? Okay. That's, um, so we have um, another question about um, can you, this is from Deborah, and can you say anything about the way the people of Plymouth felt about coming under the governance of the Bay Colony, given that they yeah. had, you know, some differing attitudes? So that's a, that's a great question, and it's such a funny thing in Plymouth Colony's history. So Plymouth has a patent, but never gets a royal charter. Unlike the Bay Colony, unlike Rhode Island, unlike Connecticut, um, and that seems to, you know, weaken the colony's political hand during its later decades. But the colony's leaders never really undertake a serious effort to redress uh, that problem, uh, to do what they would have needed to do uh, to get a charter um, from England, which probably would have involved you know, some, some substantial bribes, I imagine, to get the job done. Um, in 16, uh, in the mid 1680s, uh, the Crown decides to subsume uh, really all of the New England colonies into a dominion of New England. That happens just before John Alden's death, uh, which is why John Codden references it in that broadside. And then afterwards, uh, it's uncertain what's going to happen. Uh, the colony attempts to resume its self-governance uh, 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 under Governor Hinckley. Really doesn't go well. Um, the, you know, there's sort of, um, there's a lot of taxation issues and resistance to taxation uh, at the time. Hinckley sort of uh, puts into motion a very half-hearted effort to uh, get a uh, charter uh, in England. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation about whether Hinckley and some others don't mind being attached to the Bay Colony um, for one reason, that it would increase religious uniformity in uh, the counties of Plymouth Colony. Um, those Quakers and Baptists in the western part of the colony, they experience a loss of religious liberty once Plymouth Colony uh, becomes part of a larger province of Massachusetts Bay. So I think it's fair to say that opinion was mixed. There are definitely uh, some folks in Plymouth Colony towns who resent uh, becoming part of, of Massachusetts Bay and who are angry uh, at those leaders who didn't do enough to preserve the colony's uh, self-governance. Um, we have a question from G.D. Alden, um, which is, can you comment on why you mentioned John was known for his balanced or fair dealings. And then why do you think perhaps his land purchases might not have been? <coughs> well, you know, I, I, it's not a lot of evidence to go on, but, um, you know, his role in settling that one dispute down in Sandwich, where, you know, he is one of two men 
who present really the concerns of the sachem about a recent transaction and seems to try to broker you know, something of a fair settlement. I'm sort of looking to that as an example of a fair dealing. I'm not suggesting that his land purchases in the 1660s in Namaskat weren't on the up and up. It's simply that those, if you look at all of the land transactions as a whole in the 1660s and 1670s, those are the transactions that directly contribute to the circumstances that bring about the war in the 1670s. And many of those transactions by other individuals, uh, in my opinion, were rather crooked and involved a lot of pressure and coercion and swindling. I think that was certainly the case uh, in what's now Little Compton, uh, Rhode Island, which was then part of Plymouth Colony. Um, so I don't, I'm not, I wasn't bringing that up to cast particular aspersions on uh, John Alden, just to point out that he participates in this westward expansion of the colony that creates um, what become very bloody conflicts. Can you touch a little bit on, you know, the, the word Freeman sometimes causes a lot of confusion and also um, the differences between uh, uh, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay um, on, you know, whether or not you were a member of the church, you know, you could be more active in the community or, you know, in Plymouth, they didn't require that. So could you touch a little bit on that? Sure. So the word Freeman, it actually has this longer history in its English context, which means a person in a town or community that has certain rights and obligations. It would, would often be, you know, you'd, you'd have the right, you'd have the obligation to pay some taxes and maybe participate in the town watch, uh, but you'd also get some participation in political affairs. In the Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay context, I'm really simply using it as someone who has the right to vote, which is its most obvious meaning in the 17th century. It doesn't mean, um, it, it, it's not exactly the same as freedmen, say in the 19th century American context as a, as a freed slave. Um, and Massachusetts Bay, one has to belong to one of the established churches in order to be a freeman with the right to vote. Um, in Plymouth Colony, that's not the case. However, it's worth noting that as the years pass, religious dissent could bring about a loss of political privileges, as happened to um, many of the Quakers and their supporters. So it's not as, it, it wouldn't be quite accurate to say there was no religious test for uh, voting rights or political participation. It just was not, it wasn't there early on and it never became as strict as it was in the Bay Colony. Um, there have been several uh, questions and comments in the chat about your book and the place that you would recommend that people um, purchase it. Oh, that's a great, great question. Well, you know, I know when the book first came out, which is almost two years ago, uh, Plymouth Hall, uh, excuse me, Pilgrim Hall was a great place to purchase it if you're uh, local. Um, maybe it still is. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I haven't been there in a little while. Um, I mean, a, other than that, it's, it's available at all, you know, normal booksellers. Um, I, should, I should try to make sure it's more available uh, locally uh, near you, uh, Desiree. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are coming up on our hour that um, we very much appreciate your time. Um, would you be willing, because there are, you know, people have follow on questions and so forth. Um, would you be willing to share, you know, we, we can forward them to you or if you want, you can share an email. Um, I'll, you know, what is your preference on that? I will or just we punch. can send you the questions. <laughs> yeah, I just punched in my email. I love, I, you know, okay. I love corresponding with folks. Um, I love it uh, if people 
you know, find errors in my book. I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> I actually got a, I got a letter from somewhere recently. I had messed up something about uh, James II and his family. And, you know, my goodness, can't get it all right. <laughs> Well, John, this has been a fabulous way to spend our lunch hour here, especially on um, such a, a wintry day. And we want to thank you for your time. Um, I know people really enjoyed this presentation, and I think you'll get a lot of um, um, requests for your book. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Our next program is going to be in March, please check out the Eldon website and it will be about King Philip's War by a co-author Michael Tukius. So thank you all again for joining us. Please check us out if you're in the Plymouth area or for some of the other online programming. John, thanks again. Thanks so much, my pleasure. All right, bye-bye everyone. <laughs>